Good morning and welcome. This is 10 Years Hence. Let's meet this morning's speaker. Bill Chamberlain is principal analyst for IBM Corporate Market Research and a member of the IBM Academy of Technology. Mr. Chamberlain leads IBM's internal Horizon Watch trend research program. Their research helps business leaders understand and plan for emerging technologies and disruptive trends, including trends such as the Internet of Things, business analytics, cognitive computing, and social business. During the last 14 years, Mr. Chamberlain has devoted much of his time to helping IBMers understand potential futures. He performs research and analysis and reports on emerging trends and business opportunities that will affect IBM in the future. His expertise lies in uh, both performing secondary and competitive emerging technology trends research, as well as running consultative workshops for teams to help them translate insights into strategies and action plans. Mr. Chamberlain founded IBM's Horizon Watch community. The internal IBM community focuses on understanding current and disruptive tech trends. He supports the community with a blog, conference calls, and annual trend reports. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome back to the Notre Dame campus, Mr. Bill Chamberlain. Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Uh, I just, I just learned a, a lesson that uh, I probably should learn a long time ago. When you go to the bathroom before you present, always make sure your zipper is up. And uh, so thank you, uh, Sam. Uh, the, uh, I, I'm placing out here before I begin uh, a stack of business cards. So one of the things I like to do is I, I do like to mentor students uh, that are uh, interested in what's going on in the job world and try to assist them in uh, navigating that, that path. Uh, so, you know, if I get a hundred of you coming down and wanting to do that, it, 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 I won't have time for all of you, but feel free to uh, take a business card, contact me, and uh, we can uh, maybe discuss your, your, your situation. Uh, I'd like to congratulate you on, on getting in the top 10 of the Bloomberg rankings for the undergrad uh, school here. Uh, number two is, is great. I must mention that I have two daughters at the Kelly School of Business down in Bloomington, and so you beat them out, uh, so, but congratulations. Uh, so I have a soft, part, soft uh, place in my heart for this school. Uh, I really appreciate what you've done with the Foresight and Business Program, Sam, and, and, and the rest of the team. Uh, and I love uh, mentoring students through that program as well. So I'm excited to be back here and present to you Internet of Things and the Future of Work. Uh, your whole series has been on really the future of work and what that looks like. And as I look out for what is gonna span your careers, uh, there is so much exciting things that are going to happen, and we're going to go through some of them uh, today. My, my agenda here is the following. I'm going to take you through uh, you know, what uh, a little introduction to kind of set the stage for where we come from the past and where we're going. Uh, then I'm going to kind of define what this Internet of Things is, because we're still kind of in this hype stage of everybody talking about the Internet of Things. And then I will talk a little bit about how it's going to transform work. Uh, I'll try to go through some industry examples, depending on how much time we have, and uh, discuss how it might impact retail versus manufacturing and, and so on and so forth. And then I'm going to talk about the cognitive era, the era of uh, machines that can think and reason and work uh, alongside us, because uh, I think that will be an important part of your future. Uh, and then I'm going to take you through some emerging tech trends. Uh, as was mentioned, uh, that's uh, a big part of my job is having a radar up on what the emerging tech trends are. And so I'm going to take you through some of those as it relates to the future of work. And, uh, and then we're going to end with uh, some, some observations I have about the future of work and how it, your lives are going to be impacted 
uh, as you go about your career. Okay? My presentation style is pretty quick. Uh, I'm, I like to get the information out. So uh, we'll save time at the end for questions. Uh, and I've got a couple videos in here that we're going to try to work through and, and play for you to break up the, uh, the presentation. So let's start. Uh, have a look at this slide. Does this image mean anything to you about the future of work? Uh, does anybody think they know what it means? We start in 1800 and we end in 2000 and we've got uh, three things, yes? That's really a good observation, and that's actually what the chart is depicting in a way. But actually, it's talking about the history of work in the United States. Yes. Agriculture, if you look, back in 1800, was you know, like around 90% of the people in the United States were working on a farm in some way, shape, or form. There were a few people doing industry work, uh, making things uh, and such, and hardly anybody in the services area, uh, you know, store owners and stuff. Uh, but you see where we are today. And why is this? What happened here? Well, uh, we had a, a technology actually came into play. So that's exactly right. Technology came into play and it impacted all of these jobs. And that is a, you know, a good thing about foresight, a, a good practice in foresight, is to go back and look at the past. And you can learn from the past. So uh, the interesting thing about agriculture is that even though there's less and less people as a percentage of the population in the states working in agriculture, the productivity has gone up. And that is, of course, because of technology that has come to the farming systems. Oops. So what does the future of farming look like? If you want to be a farmer today, you've got to be interested in robots and data and analytics. Uh, the, the middle slide there, the middle uh, image, is uh, kind of like a heat map of a farmer's field. And it could represent uh, water. It could represent weeds. It could represent uh, soil uh, content. It could, it could uh, represent disease. There's a number of different ways that we could look at that, that heat map, if you will. And the robots, if you will, of the future that are being rolled out today, in fact, uh, can tend those fields uh, uh, with some human uh, intervention, but uh, increasingly autonomous. Uh, so upper left is, is, a, uh, is a very large drone that can uh, do fertilizing. Um, weed killing, spraying, insect spraying and such. Down here at the bottom, bottom is a robot that uh, can do lettuce thinning, very important uh, when you're making lettuce, uh, when you're farming lettuce. Uh, there's the Hordabot uh, and the Banriba, Banarab, uh, those are both uh, capable of doing weeding. You know, so you think of the technology in there, image cameras that can detect what a weed is and what uh, you know, a uh, soybean plant isn't. You know, it, so uh, that, uh, that's all about the future of farming. So uh, again, if you're a farmer, uh, start thinking about learning about robots and drones. Uh, and, and for the rest of us, um, we're seeing a lot of these uh, headlines about robots that are going to be taking our jobs. And they're all over. You could just go out there and Google, which I did to pull these up. But there's, there's tons of articles out there talking about studies that are talking about robots taking our jobs or technology taking our jobs. And frankly, you could have gone, if, if we could have Googled you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, you would have seen the same type of articles talking about computers taking jobs away. Uh, so, the fact is that, yes, robots will steal some of our jobs. And I'll talk more about what type of jobs that they might steal on the road. Uh, but they're also going to give us new jobs. There's going to be a whole bunch of new uh, careers available to those of you in the room 
uh, around uh, the idea of using robots in our work every day. So let's talk about how this fits into our discussion and, and where we are today. Uh, I've got up here a, a very interesting um, depiction, if you will, of an article that uh, Carlotta Perez, an economist, wrote uh, a number of years ago. And her hypothesis was that there's been these waves of economic and social transformation that have gone on throughout the United States. And, uh, and you can see how that has affected, uh, in the previous chart, the agriculture industry and the industrial sector and, and, and the services sector. And uh, what she has talked about, and I won't go into detail, but it ends up, we, we go through this mass frenzy of building up this technology, if you will, and we get to a certain point and there's a crash, an economic or a social crash. And what happens is it takes some time, but eventually a new platform, if you will, matures uh, related to that technology, and uh, that, ma uh, that technology matures and it benefits society uh, because it's mass adopted. So where we are right now is, in fact, we had that crash, if you will. And we're building out this new platform. And what does that new platform look like? Well, uh, the green is, is my depiction of what that new platform looks like. And uh, we've gone from, uh, from a uh, characteristics of computing systems from these computers back in the 1930s that all they did was tabulate numbers, tabulate things, if you will, added up numbers, uh, to programmable systems, and uh, we're now entering a cognitive uh, era where machines can learn and adapt uh, autonomously. And we've had a number of different generations of computers, and uh, where we're at today is we have things, um, things, devices that have embedded uh, power in them computer power in them. Uh, that is all impacting data. I'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, and then uh, if you think about the internet itself, we have gone from like these static pages where companies uh, just kind of display um, uh, information about their company to where you could actually con conduct business with those companies. And now we're basically into a very social, mobile, interactive internet. And that's all building us, that's all giving us this platform. Uh, and it's moving us to what I call the cognitive IoT era. An era built off of these things that collect data and then machines that can work with that data and help humans do their work better. All right, so what is the Internet of Things? Uh, basically, it's a, um, you know, it's a, uh, it's embedding technology in everyday devices that allows you to connect to networks and allows you, in doing so, to send and receive data. So you can think of any, anything uh, that's out there. If you put a device on there that can connect to the internet, it can then sense and, and send and receive communications. Uh, and we're doing that today uh, in an in increasingly fashion, right? And what's happening is there are more and more things being connected every day. More and more of us are wearing Fitbits or, or Apple Watches, or we're, connect, we're in the home, we're seeing the ability to have um, you know, the, the Nest or light bulbs. Um, our cars are becoming more and more internet connected. And this will affect uh, our personal lives tremendously in the future. Uh, but it will also greatly impact work. And we're projecting, everybody, all the analysts are projecting that uh, the, the amount or the number of connected devices are it just, we're gonna go up geometrically uh, in the next few years. 5.5 uh, million new things will get connected every day in 2016, according to Gartner. Uh, there's another stat out that the average human uh, by the end of this year, we'll have 5.5 connected devices. That's if you average across the whole globe. So uh, it, it's pretty amazing to think about uh, all these connected things. 
When I talk about the Internet of Things and, and define it for people who really have not heard about it much, I like to draw the analogy with the human uh, nervous system. So think of the human nervous system and all the uh, neurons that are in the body. And, and in fact, you know, I'm not a scientist, but I, I read that there's over 85 billion neurons just in the brain alone. And when I think of a neuron, I think of a sensor, something that you know, can, can sense something and communicate to the brain. And there, you know, as humans, we have these different specialized sensors, right? Five uh, major senses. And uh, machines in the future, uh, these things that are out there, uh, will, will basically be connected to sensor devices that can do all this, can sense and respond. Uh, so that's kind of how I, when I think of the Internet of Things, I think of a human nervous system basically for a business. Uh, okay, here's my, my first video. So, oops. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Daniel. Yeah. The Internet of Things is changing much about the world we live in. This is about from a three-minute video. To how we make purchases, uh, I hope it won't put you to and sleep, even how we get energy for our homes. Uh, I think Sophisticated about sensors and chips are embedded the in the physical is. things that surround us, each transmitting valuable data. Data that lets us better understand how these things work and work together. But how exactly do all these devices share such large quantities of data? And how do we put that information to work? Whether we're improving the production of a factory, giving city residents real-time updates on where to park, or monitoring our personal health, it's the common Internet of Things platform that brings this diverse information together and provides the common language for the devices and apps to communicate with each other. The process starts with the devices themselves, which securely communicate with an Internet of Things platform. This platform integrates the data from many devices and applies analytics to share the most valuable data with applications that address industry-specific needs. Let's start with a simple example, a car. After taking a long road trip, Rebecca notices that her check engine light has come on. She knows that she needs to have her car looked at by a mechanic, but is not sure whether it's something minor or something that needs immediate attention. As it turns out, the sensor that triggered Rebecca's check engine light monitors the pressure in her brake line. This sensor is one of many monitoring processes throughout the car, which are constantly communicating with each other. A component in the car called the diagnostic bus gathers the data from all these sensors, then passes it to a gateway in the car. The gateway integrates and sorts the data from the sensors. This way, only the most relevant diagnostic information will be transmitted to the manufacturer's platform. But before sending this organized data, the car's gateway and platform must first register with each other and confirm a secure communication. The platform is constantly gathering and storing thousands of bits of information from Rebecca's car and hundreds of thousands of cars like hers, building an historical record in a secure database. The manufacturer has added rules and logic to the platform. So when Rebecca's car sends a signal that her brake fluid has dropped below a recommended level, the platform triggers an alert in her car. The manufacturer also uses the platform to create and manage applications that solve specific issues. In this case, the manufacturer can deploy an application on the platform called the Asset Management System. This application oversees all of their customers' cars on the road, as well as all the parts in their warehouses. It uses the data from Rebecca's car to offer her a potential appointment time to service her car, directions to the nearest certified dealer, and a coupon for the service. What's more, the app will ensure that Rebecca's brakes are covered under her warranty that the correct replacement part is ordered and then sent to the dealership so it is ready when she arrives. But the manufacturer's analysis does not stop there. They have also deployed a continuous engineering application that tracks not only Rebecca's car, but hundreds of thousands of others, looking for ways to improve the design and manufacturing process of the car itself. If the same problem in her brake line crops up in a critical number of other cars, the manufacturer uses applications custom built for the automobile industry to pinpoint the exact problem. They can see if these cars were made at the same factory, used the same parts, or came off the assembly line on the same day. 
So what do all these pieces add up to? Streamlined inventory management for the dealer, a better, safer car from the manufacturer. And for Rebecca, it means she can be back on the road faster and get to where she's going safely. All thanks to the Internet of Things. Okay, so what that showed us was a simple example of, of uh, uh, where, where Internet of Things might play into, uh, you know, our... What if you never waited at another red light ever again? It went to another one. Sorry about that. I'll learn that for the next time. <laughs> So what that showed us was a, you know, uh, an application that uh, for uh, consumers uh, about uh, how the Internet of Things might impact our lives. But think about it from the manufacturer standpoint. Uh, they're collecting data on those cars. And for the dealers, they're probably able to do uh, more work, better work, uh, reduce errors. Uh, so, in the end, it, uh, that's just one example, but uh, it, it, you can kind of think about how the Internet of Things might work. And so, uh, my next section is about how the IoT will transform work. And uh, this is a slide out of a, a McKinsey study that they, what they tried to do was figure out what's going to be the actual impact of the Internet of Things. <laughs> They, their analysis shows that it could actually provide economic value up to $11 trillion. Uh, I don't know about you, but a trillion dollars seems like a lot of money. And uh, the, uh, the key industries that they're talking about is factories, industrial internet of things. Uh, they're talking about uh, cities, smart cities. They're talking about uh, energy, utilities, retail, uh, a number of different areas. Uh, very interesting study uh, if you want to go look at it and uh, pretty much an uh, uh, important study for those of us in the industry because it, it really kind of laid out, it was a few, couple years ago now, but we still refer to it. Uh, so the transformation is going to happen and it's going to happen in a number of areas. Uh, it's going to allow companies to improve their operating systems, helping them lower their costs, streamline processes. It's going to allow them to create new products, embedding uh, intelligence into their products, uh, and allowing them to deliver new services. And most importantly, it's going to help them engage with their customers better. Like we saw in that video, uh, they're able to uh, provide a better experience for the car owner by helping them, when that brake light comes on, actually get it fixed, right? So uh, these are areas that we're tracking in terms of the benefits. Let's talk about uh, the data uh, that's going to be collected. And this is a list of all the different types of sensors that are characterized by the, the quote unquote sensor community. And you just kind of think of all these different types of uh, sensors, the ability to collect information. And it's going to help us understand uh, things like, you know, weather. Uh, IBM just bought uh, some of the weather channel assets last fall. And it's really a data play. We want to collect all the data on weather so that it can help us uh, help our clients uh, plan out their businesses uh, and their product and service deliveries better. But it's going to... You know, sensors can tell us our location, it can tell us the status of assets, whether a water meter is open or closed, uh, it can, uh, and then you start thinking about all the cameras and the social uh, uh, texting that's going on today. Uh, there's just data now that's being collected from all these sensors, all these capabilities, and the, uh, the key here is it's different types of data. Uh, on, the, uh, on this chart, you'll see the, uh, the types of data going up the scale. Traditional enterprise data is things like transactional data, right? You buy a product, you per have, there's a purchase order or a sales order. That goes into a, a, a system. 
And uh, that was basically all there was back here on the left-hand side of the chart. But now we're seeing different types of data, and it's unstructured. Uh, data coming in from video cameras, right? Uh, data coming in from uh, social conversations uh, on the internet. Uh, and uh, all this sensor data that I talked about. And that is the type of data that is increasingly exploding. And it's hard for traditional computers to make sense of that data. So uh, the, the key things that I think have changed or are changing here in the last five years and going forward in the next five years is there's this more of this type of data we saw on the right hand side of that chart, more of this unstructured type of data. Uh, there's data coming in in real time, like brake warning lights, you know, not only, you know, providing information back to the manufacturer. Uh, there's this idea of selling data for profit. Uh, data is, is, is like the new oil uh, of, the, of, of today's economy. It's being bought and sold. There's value in that data. Uh, we can integrate these data streams more effectively. All that type of data we saw on the previous chart on the right hand side, uh, our, our automated, our, our information systems are getting smarter on how to integrate those, those different types of data and allow us to do analytics off of that data. Uh, and then there's this talk of this cognitive IoT, which I'll talk a little bit more, but it's about having uh, these things, if you will, uh, be able to uh, simulate learning and uh, learn as, as they go. So these are the key things I think that are driving, uh, that will continue to drive changes in our information systems which will impact your jobs uh, in the future. So the, the value in I, IoT, uh, Internet of Things, is really going to be all about the analyzing of that data stream, those data streams. Um, it's said that uh, about 80, that the previous chart that I had up there on the right hand side, it said that you know basically of this data that is above the enterprise data, uh, today we're not analyzing, uh, we're only analyzing about 10% of that data. So there's all that data out there that we're not even looking at. So, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work that, that can be done there. And uh, so, you know, the types of questions that we're going to be able to ask in the future is things like, you know, what's happening in my retail stores right now? Uh, what could happen if we moved this product uh, to this location in the store versus where it is in the back of the store right now? What could happen? Uh, what action should I take? Why? Why did sales go down yesterday? Um, and so on and so forth. So we're going to be able to ask more questions. And we're going to ask these questions uh, basically to, uh, to the, the computer systems themselves. And they'll be able to provide us with answers. But we won't be able to do it if we don't have this uh, Internet of Things that I've been talking about enabled. Uh, that's the key first step. OK. Uh, it's. The Internet of Things is impacting uh, all industries uh, across the board, some more than others. I talked about uh, McKinsey stating that manufacturing is the key one, and rightly so. There's just a lot more data that, that can be collected uh, in, in the manufacturing environment. Uh, but it, it is impacting all industries. Uh, it's, uh, let's go through a few of these. Uh, and I've got... Uh, three or four slides here that are very text heavy, and I apologize for that, but uh, I'll, I'm sure I'll be uh, distributing the slides, you'll be able to get a copy of them. Uh, uh, just in the area of, of, uh, of manufacturing, and you think of all the different types of areas that we could be collecting data, we can be collecting it on the shop floor, that can help us with production. Uh, we can uh, collect data all about the movement of goods throughout the supply chain. And it's just not about tracking the location of that good, but let's track what's happening that good along the way, that package. Or if I'm, tra if I have, uh, if I'm uh, moving produce through the logistics system, I want to keep it maybe at a certain temperature. So what's the temperature of uh, that, uh, you know, that box ahead of lettuce that is being shipped right now? What, you know, what's going on? Uh, 
And then the products themselves, being able to embed you know, sensor technology into these products help manufacturers learn how customers are using the products themselves. So uh, manufacturing is pretty big. Uh, retail is another one uh, that I like to talk about because uh, there's a lot in a store right now that, that we could be collecting data on that we're not. Um, and, and I really do think that in the future, the, the, uh, the stores will be much more automated so that uh, I, you know, I as a manager in that store can get a notification right away when there's, there's too many uh, people at a checkout line because the, the cameras are going to tell me, uh, be able to recognize how many people are in the checkout line right now. Um, and there's, there's all different types of things it could do in the, in the back of the store as well in terms of monitoring uh, the location of, of products, uh, monitoring, again, the temperature of products, so on and so forth. Uh, so retail is another big area. Uh, I talk about utilities here. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a, I would say probably in terms of spending right now, the second highest spending industry is, is energy and utilities. Uh, the, there's a lot of investment in the smart meters, uh, smart grids, uh, and just uh, on the back end or the asset end, a lot of asset management and, and monitoring there. Uh, I'll talk about drones in a little bit, but the, uh, you know, some of the, the, the utility companies are using drones to monitor uh, the wires uh, for distributing energy as well as the pipeline, the pipes for distributing uh, you know, things like natural gas and stuff. Healthcare is uh, another important area, uh, and I'll mention this, uh, that you know, the, these, the Fitbits and the, the watches and such uh, of today that are monitoring our fitness, uh, those types of devices will, in the future, of course, will be tied into our healthcare system uh, with privacy and security for the user, but it will allow, uh, allow us to receive care uh, a lot quicker and allow us to monitor our own health uh, a lot, lot easier. Uh, so remote patient monitoring is a very uh, important area, I think, uh, that's going to impact your lifetime. Uh, and it will impact those going into the medical profession as well. Uh, here's some other industries. Uh, we had the, the video on the, uh, the lady in the car, and you saw the one image maybe of, of all the cars being uh, tied into the network. Uh, think about what that will be in the future. We're, you know, there's the, we're talking about driverless cars today, and if you can think of the scenario down the road where all these cars are basically an internet Wi-Fi on wheels, and they're connected into the larger Wi-Fi system as they're traveling down the road, uh, the, the data and the analytics that are being collected on that to make sure traffic moves slow, uh, moves, uh, you know, uh, uh, moves through the system very, you know, from a safety perspective and from a, a speed perspective, uh, the amount of data analytics is pretty impressive. So that's all going to be accomplished with uh, these sensors, these things, if you will, being intelligent and uh, a nice back-end system to monitor the safety of everything. All right, let's talk about the cognitive era. Um, and We'll see if I've learned my, my lesson here on how to get the video up. And Daniel's coming over just to Category is U.S. cities, and here is the clue. Its largest airport is named for a World War II hero. Its second largest for a World War II battle. 30 seconds, players, good luck. We come to you, Ken. You had 2,400 for this final going in, and you wrote down what is Chicago. That is correct, and you wagered 
$2,400. That doubles your score to $4,800. Down to Brad now. He had $5,400. I have to feel that he came up with a correct response. Did he? Yes. And the wager? Doing almost everything you can. $5,000 takes you up to $10,400. Now to our leader, Watson, going into final $36,681. And the response was, what is Toronto? With a lot of question marks, which means, of course, that Watson had many, many doubts. And the wager, how much are you going to lose? Oh, you sneak. $947. Thirty-five thousand seven hundred and thirty-four. Oh, you're right. You're right. I got it. Got it. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. All right. So, um, as you uh, as you remember, maybe remember, you, maybe you don't, but that was from 2011, and uh, that was Watson failing to get the uh, the answer correct on the final Jeopardy question uh, in February of 2011. And Watson says, uh, you know, what is Toronto? And how could Watson mess up like that? Uh, well, first of all, this is back in 2011 and Watson was just kind of learning, but Watson was dealing with a database uh, of uh, what, what you could call factoid databases, it was just a database of facts. Uh, and it hadn't really learned, uh, you know, uh, the nuances of, of that type of data. It, one of the things they did during training was they taught, uh, taught Watson that sometimes the categories in Jeopardy aren't really what they really mean. So the category here was US cities. And Watson thought, well, maybe they're trying to trick me. And so Watson knew that in Toronto, uh, Canada, there was an American uh, 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 a baseball team that was in the American League. So it associated America with with Toronto. Uh, there's also some cities in, in the US that are called Toronto. It couldn't find any connection between uh, World War II and uh, the airports. It, it just couldn't figure it out. Sorry, I should have uh, should put that in airplane mode. Uh, so anyway, Watson knew that it was having problems coming up with the right answer. And Watson knew that uh, you know, because it was you know, not really sure what the answer was, it put a low probability on the answer of Toronto, very low probability. And so that's why Watson bet low. Uh, and, but this is back you know, five years ago. The Watson of today is uh, analyzing much more than just uh, these factoid databases, but uh, it's, it's, it's analyzing, like I said, all that unstructured data as well, uh, and it's, um, uh, it's grown up, if you will. So, uh, but the key thing is, is, uh, is that Watson is uh, now learning, and we as humans, we go through this cognitive cycle of how we learn, and it, you know, it's observing. We observe things in, in our environment. We interpret them. When we observe, right, we're using our senses. And then we, we analyze that information, interpret. We evaluate uh, what all that means to us. We take in uh, account uh, the risk of maybe not really fully understanding uh, our environment. And then we make a decision. We decide. And as we go through this cycle more and more, we, we learn. We learn how we make decisions. And we build up our own knowledge base, if you will. And Watson and other cognitive machines are going through this cycle as well. And uh, um, so it, it's, it's, uh, it's a very exciting time for cognitive systems. The cognitive systems that we're building uh, have basic three qualities that we're, we're trying to ingrained into that technology. We want these systems to be able to understand, be able, through, their, through their sensing, uh, be able to understand what they're reading, uh, what they're seeing, what type of images, uh, the videos that they're, they're, they're trying, we're trying to help them uh, uh, utilize uh, natural language processing capability and understand uh, cultural differences, gender differences in terms of voice and meaning and, and things like that. A lot of uh, research and technology is going into this understand. And then 
we want them to understand and, and learn how to reason with that data. In other words, you know, do that interpretation and that, that evaluating. Uh, and so, you know, let's organize all the bucket of information and, and try to integrate it and, and come up with different, uh, different alternatives. And what Watson and cognitive systems do well is, uh, okay, is, um, we, is that they assign probabilities to the decision process uh, within all that. So, um, and then at the end, it's that learning cycle. The more times we're going through that cycle, the more time we learn. So uh, I apologize for not putting this on airplane mode. So this is what a, a cognitive system is, is capable of. Now, think about the first half of this talk when I talked about the Internet of Things and all those sensors being out there and all that data that's coming in and have that data be available now to these cognitive systems of the future that will allow them to sense all of that data and frankly do it a lot faster than humans can do it and be able to handle a lot more information right now than humans can do it and make sense of that and interpret it. And uh, the, the cognitive IoT era uh, that you are going to grow up in in your careers is it, just going to be fascinating uh, as uh, we have these machines that are going to allow us to really make better better business decisions. All right, so let's uh, let's try another video here, and uh, hopefully the video will explain it a little bit better than than I did. Uh, but what makes what makes a cognitive system? And as you can see. I'm learning a little bit better as I go through the cycle. Computing systems of the past have operated in predictable environments, using structured and uniform data to perform prescribed operations. Now we have cognitive computing systems, which are much more adaptable and similar to a human brain, can understand, reason, and learn. These systems can read vast amounts of unstructured data and use it to spot connections and patterns in new ways, offering insight into all kinds of human expression. Cognitive systems are built on several underlying technologies. Let's take a look at two. First, natural language processing starts with understanding. The system needs to understand human language in context as opposed to structured tables. This natural language processing pulls information from articles, research reports, emails, tweets, even images and sounds to identify the significant grammar, context, and vocabulary that carry core meaning. Second, there's machine learning, a technique in which the system spots connections between a particular pattern and the most likely outcomes. The system receives feedback from regular use, so it learns from every interaction. Each prediction it makes, whether right or wrong, is taken into account for the next prediction until it can reliably spot the meaningful patterns through all the noise. With these technologies, a cognitive system doesn't offer one definitive answer. Instead, it is designed to weigh the information and ideas from many sources, to reason, and then offer rationales for its conclusions. This makes it more than just a tool that enables you, but a trusted advisor. Okay, so, um, you know, the, the video just showed two aspects of cognitive systems, right? Machine learning and NLP, natural language processing. There's a lot more that's coming on board with these cognitive systems. Uh, just think of a video alone of a, a computer being able to uh, uh, basically, you know, bring in that video feed and make sense of it, understand what's going on in that video. Uh, in image processing. Uh, IBM's heavily investing now in the medical field for Watson-like systems to be able to uh, look at x-rays and MRI scans, uh, CAT scans, and understand what's going on in there and provide the doctor with uh, you know, a probability list of, of things that they should be looking at uh, and maybe perhaps other tests they should be performing on that patient. Uh, so there's... Uh, um, a lot of other different types of what we are calling APIs that are involved in, in building the Watson. Uh, not going to go into it this slide in detail, but if, if you if, remember what I talked about, all the things that are happening, 
uh, within, in terms of IoT impacting different industries. Well, it, as you add cognitive onto that, you're gonna get uh, even a richer array of capabilities within industries so that uh, systems can uh, help uh, management make better decisions, it can help customers uh, fly through the, uh, the uh, uh, fly through, uh, use the airlines uh, a lot easier and so on and so forth. So it, that type of uh, understanding, learning and reasoning that the cognitive systems are, are enabling is, is gonna be amazing. So let's, I wanna move uh, quickly on uh, and uh, through the rest of this pitch and then set up the Q&A session. So let's take a quick run through uh, emerging tech trends that will impact your careers, uh, I believe. Uh, robots, yes, uh, the robots are coming. And uh, on the left-hand side is a robot called Pepper. Uh, this one is, is really neat because uh, it uh, was designed to uh, do a better job of detecting emotions uh, of, of uh, humans. So you, you, you walk up to it and it will interact with you and uh, uh, through voice and you can ask it questions and stuff. We have embedded this, we've worked with uh, SoftBank, the manufacturer of this, we've embedded it with Watson technology so that you can go up and you can ask it questions, you can actually have a conversations, cam conversation with Pepper. Uh, if you go out and look on YouTube and just uh, look for Pepper videos, uh, you'll see some of that going on. Uh, Baxter, you might have seen Baxter, it's uh, been designed uh, uh, for the, uh, uh, really for the manufacturing environment and it's not a real, uh, it, it's an intelligent robot in the aspect that it, it can, uh, you can teach it and it can learn uh, tasks to do, but it's also a social robot, so you can, uh, it's, it socializes with the workers around it. Uh, so uh, that one's a, a fairly cheap uh, robot to place in the manufacturing environment. Other robots, uh, the Kampai robot, uh, upper left corner there, that's uh, elder care. Um, this is a big industry. Uh, that, uh, we're seeing a lot of interest in Japan uh, on the aging demographic you know, uh, uh, segment and applying robots to that segment. Uh, Connie is a relatively new robot that Hilton Hotels has, has put out. It's a concierge, you can walk up and ask Connie questions about, uh, you know, can you can you get me tickets tonight for the uh, for the local play, uh, or where's a good uh, restaurant that uh, you know where's a good Chinese food restaurant that is within five miles? Uh, it it you can go up and, and converse with that. Uh, Tug over on the right hand side is being used in hospitals to do everything from haul laundry down the halls to the laundry room to uh, delivering medication, to delivering uh, surgical supplies. Uh, it, it will do almost anything in, in, in terms of movement of items within a hospital uh, and do it all autonomously. Uh, Fetch is, is a similar one, but it's for picking and it's a very inexpensive picker. Uh, so for a small store with a, a warehouse behind it that maybe does uh, an internet business as well, uh, it, it, it will allow you to uh, pick goods off of your shelves and trans, uh, transport it to the shipping department. Uh, Robonaut is a, a NASA, rest, uh, NASA uh, robot. Uh, it's gone through a couple versions already. They envision this robot being embedded with Watson technology and being able to uh, deploy outside the space station. There's one in the space station right now. Uh, Bottler is a hotel robot, a similar type of thing that we're seeing Tug do in a hospital, it, it can do in a hotel. So uh, this, uh, there's a hotel out in San Francisco so that's using this right now. And you know you, you get in late at night and you call up and say, hey, I, I didn't bring, uh, my, my razor and my, my uh, shaving cream, uh, this will send it right up to your room and it will ring your phone when you get gets to your room, you can open the door and you can uh, uh, open the compartment. There's a you know, code that it gives you. Uh, so those are some robots. Um, and the, uh, the drones are coming. Uh, of course, they're, they're here for consumer and we've seen them at concerts and stuff. Uh, and for other type of media and entertainment. But there's other things that uh, these drones are gonna be doing. Uh, construction building, uh, inspection, uh, 
a lot, you know, throwing a, uh, a, as you're building a, a high rise, it's much easier to send a drone up there to look for, oh, did, you know, is there a part up there that we forgot? It's, uh, it's very easy to do that. Uh, the air mule is an interesting one that's being tested to uh, actually, uh, it can lift uh, thousands of pounds, right? And one of the things that they're projecting this might be used for, at least in the military application, is to uh, lift uh, soldiers off of a battlefield. Uh, so it, it's kind of thought of as, as maybe an, a, uh, um, a future ambulance, if you will. Uh, mining, uh, drones are being used to uh, you know, scan uh, the, the geographical landscape, understand what that landscape looks like, or uh, send these drones actually down into below ground mines instead of sending the humans down there. Uh, insurance claims, being able to send a drone up and, and help with an insurance uh, claim uh, situation. Uh, disaster relief, uh, being able maybe to deliver supplies in a disaster situation or just you know taking the video will be help very helpful. And of course, security and police. I didn't mention logistics. That's the obvious application uh, that uh, is being talked a lot in the media. Delivery uh, cars, driverless cars is a big talk right now. Uh, we've got the, you know, a lot of focus on driverless cars in, in the auto industry right now. But I want you to think outside of driverless cars and think about driverless vehicles or uh, any type of transportation vehicle. So uh, uh, the uh, truck industry is very interested in this uh, from the aspect of making these trucks driverless and uh, the, you just, you know, you go drive down the interstate now, you see truck after truck after truck. Well, what, what would happen if, if those are driverless? Um, and if you think that through, uh, and you think through some of these other uh, ideas like cargo ships that are, don't need anybody on board that go from port to port, uh, or cargo planes actually that maybe could be flown without uh, anybody on the plane, uh, you start thinking about a, a autonomous supply chain system where uh, the robots make the goods, they deliver it to the shipping department, a robot packs a delivery vehicle that then goes to uh, a, you know, a distribution point where the semis are loaded autonomously and then driven and at the other end of the supply chain, the same thing happens. Uh, with the drone maybe delivering it. In the middle, we've got a Domino's Pizza delivery. Uh, it's a concept for a, a delivery motorcycle, if you will, uh, that Domino's thinking about delivering pizzas. Uh, it calls you up when uh, it arrives at your location and you come down and uh, interact with the vehicle. It opens up and, and your pizza's ready. Anyway, um, again, as you hear a lot of talk and read about driverless cars, think about the extension to the rest of the transportation system. Uh, it will happen. Uh, wearables, augmented reality, virtual reality, uh, that is all gonna impact your jobs as well. Uh, you know, from a definitional standpoint, I think of augmented reality as you need a screen in front of you, uh, whether, it's a, whether it's a phone you're holding up and information is displayed on there, or maybe it's a Google Glass, a, a smart, smart glass, or whatever it is. Uh, or maybe it's just a, a, a screen on the wall, but it's, uh, it's augmented real with uh, reality. Uh, so it's, it's gonna help us in all these industries. Uh, the uh, image down here on the lower right is a bunch of engineers, let's say, uh, all with virtual reality glasses on, looking at a car that really isn't there, but it's been designed by the engineering department, and all four of them are basically looking at the same image, and they're interacting, they're moving around this, this car that is, is uh, really uh, you know, only seen through their glasses. Uh, and then uh, wearables will impact uh, all sorts of areas, including maintenance and, and such, so that uh, this guy is uh, maybe looking at a screen that has blueprints uh, about this engine, and maybe he's talking also on the phone back to an engineer in, in the engineering department. Uh, there's a couple really non-physical things as well, interesting non-physical uh, examples that I wanted to give you. Uh, Wibbits is a company that basically is doing something really interesting. It's looking at, uh, it's creating a video for you from written story. So you feed it a written story, it goes out and, and grabs stock video and will create a, a video story from that, from that text. 
Um, so that you know, that uh, could be a very interesting application for uh, for news media. Uh, down below is uh, narrative science, which uh, has created uh, the capability to basically uh, write stories for you uh, uh, and write news articles. Uh, so it it will develop the text for you uh, based on what it finds out on the internet without human involvement. Uh, from a technology standpoint, uh, there's a lot of investment going on. Artificial intelligence, Internet of Things. Uh, we haven't talked about uh, blockchain and Bitcoin. Uh, there's uh, really evidence in every industry of technology continuing to be uh, created, funded, and rolled out. Uh, so this, this is... Uh, uh, just uh, you know, $200 billion recently raised across 10 categories. Um, and this is just a, an artificial intelligence map, if you will, talking about all the different startups and investments going on in the AI field. And it's, it's a hotbed of activity right now. Uh, there's, just, there's so much going on and so many different components of artificial intelligence from natural language speech processing, to gesture control uh, applications, to computer vision. Uh, very, very, uh, it's, it's kind of like the Wild West now of technology, artificial intelligence. All right, so let's close up uh, with some ideas about what the future of work is going to be like for you. Uh, here's my thought about what the future organizational you know, chart might look like. You've got management, of course, at the top. They've got what I would call a cognitive coach. It's maybe something, uh, an app on their phone that helps them make decisions. Uh, maybe it's Watson. And then you've got smart things uh, that may be smart you know, robot assistant that, uh, that they are working with. Uh, and then in the organization, you've got these smart things. They could be robots, drones, other machines. It could be a smart conference room. It could be a smart building, uh, whatever it could be. Uh, then you have employees, and the employees have these smart things and cognitive coaches. We haven't even talked about customers, but technology impacts customers as well because uh, we're rolling out new ways for the customers to do things themselves rather than us having to employ, uh, employ people to do that work. So, uh, and then there's other stakeholders and their coaches as well. But this is kind of my mind of what, what the future org chart might look like. So when I think about what is going to get automated down the road? Um, what jobs might go away because of automation? Uh, I think of anything that is routine and repetitive uh, will probably you know, be displaced by uh, one of these smart things, if you will. And anything that is you know, routine or things like uh, things with rule-based processes and tasks repetitive manual work, any routine work where humans typically can uh, have a lot of errors, like driving a car, okay? Uh, and so, or anything that can help us in, in assisting us in making better decisions or augmenting our capabilities. Uh, the future cognitive coach uh, that I said in the organizational chart will help you answer all sorts of questions, like, what campaign should I run, what type of campaign should I run next month for this product that I'm rolling out? Uh, how much social should be in it versus print advertising? Uh, any type of question that, that we wrestle with now, uh, a computer I think might be able to help us with those types of uh, uh, questions. And so I just you know, throw up a bunch of questions here. What, what work activities will we do? Uh, you know, will you be doing throughout your career? Well, it's, it's tasks that involve higher level thinking, unstructured problems, things that have to do with multiple different types of uh, complex data, um, non-routine tasks, things that, you know, come up ad hoc, one-off, uh, that you need a specialist for. I, I've got some examples over there, you know, things that require our creativity, our artistry, when we want to provide personal customer service, strategy planning, all these higher level tasks will, um, will uh, be things that we will be working on. And we'll be using the computers and such, you know, right alongside us to help us 
with, with that type of work. We will excel at you know, things here on, on, on the left side, and the computers will uh, excel at things on the right side. Um, and, uh, that's, and we'll kind of be a partner. We'll be a partner you know, in this type of uh, uh, you know, work journey that we're going on. So let me uh, close it up uh, by you know, some things I want you to remember uh, from the talk. Uh, number one, IoT uh, delivers that data feed that is the new currency. So that, that data that's coming in uh, is, is that new, it's that new currency, it's that new oil, if you will. It's gonna drive the economy. That data will drive the economy and you need analytics of that data. You need to be able to analyze that data. If that data's coming in and it's not capable of being analyzed, uh, then it's worthless. So that, that analytics engine uh, that is behind it is my point two there. You need strong analytics. And then I think, as I mentioned, these, these things, these smart things, which will be embedded throughout our lives, uh, and the cognitive coaches that we'll have on our smartphones or whatever, uh, will allow us to you know, ask questions and get feedback on, on decisions that we need to be making. Um, and then uh, I think the last thing is, don't be afraid of technology. Um, don't be worried about it, embrace it uh, in, your, in your role, in your career, wh whatever that career is. Uh, it doesn't have to be in the technology field, but embrace the technology, become uh, excited about it, passionate about it. It, it will help you in your, in your roles, in your jobs in the future. Um, yes, it will eliminate some things we're doing today, uh, but it will also create new jobs. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, I've got a, some ways for you to get a hold of me uh, if you want. Uh, and I encourage you to reach out to me, either pick up the business card or connect with me on, on Twitter, LinkedIn. Uh, I've got a blog out there and, and uh, I've got some more slides for you out on SlideShare. Um, so uh, what I'm ready for now are some questions. Many of the things that you talk about becoming part of the Internet of Things, right here, and um, they are things that we replace very rarely, such as trains, planes, tractors, cars. So as a result, we'll have many different generations of these technologies out in the Internet of Things. How do you think we'll handle this lapse of technology and data as we go forward? Where are you? I can't even see I'm right here in the front. Oh, thanks. Um, you're hiding. Um, very good question, and uh, you know, think about the technology you've had in your own lifetime and how it's been replaced. You know, you get a new laptop every three years. You get uh, you're getting a new phone maybe every year, uh, and how that technology will be replaced. And that that um, that technology replacement uh, drives the IT professionals crazy, uh, and a, a key area that it drives them crazy in is in the area of security and privacy. Uh, to be able to make uh, the internet secure uh, requires uh, you know, intense uh, investment in, in security technology. So when I think of, of that, um, that replacement that is gonna go on, I, I think of the importance of building an IoT uh, network, a system, uh, and the data and the analytics of that uh, as secure as possible. Uh, and uh, so that's the first, you know, that's the main thing I think about, about that. Uh, and another thing I think about in relation to that question is, is uh, you know, is the concept of when are we going to actually arrive at this, uh, this future where all the cars are driverless, right? Or all the vehicles are driverless. Um, and I, I personally feel that it's going to take a little longer than, than you know, some of the people in the media are, are thinking. I think it's, it's going to take a good 25, 30 years um, for us to really begin to transform 
uh, the, the transportation network. And it might not, that image of that totally driverless system might not even happen in, in your lifetimes. Um, um, because I, I think some people will, will still hold on to their old cars uh, for a long time. But it's a good thing to think about, and it's a challenge and, and a complex problem for uh, those in the technical field. We'll go here, and then we'll go up there. You mentioned the loss of human jobs due to some of the automation, but then at the end also stated the creation of jobs from technology, and was wondering what your research had shown and or what your opinion is on the, the total impact of jobs, whether it's a net gain or a net loss for humans. Yeah, very good question. And there's a lot of studies out there that we're seeing. Uh, if you go back to that, that's, you know, one of the slides I showed up with all the headlines, those were coming from different studies. And so, you know, everybody's like procrastinating now, you know, what, what, how many jobs we're actually gonna lose. Um, and uh, I, you know, what I saw recently, uh, which was done by a company called Forrester Research, uh, was pretty good last September. They predicted a net loss of about nine million jobs. Nine million. Uh, there's been other studies that have been projected, as you saw, you know, 50 million upwards of 100 million jobs, and you know, uh, but I think I think it will be more towards the area of like nine million jobs, and. Uh, you know, what, what you gotta imagine is, is all the jobs, you know, that, that will be created. We can't even imagine the jobs that are gonna, gonna be created. I think if you back up to the year like 1980 or 1990 and, and asked somebody about how computers were gonna impact jobs, people would have thought that there was gonna be a huge impact. And what, what it did was it created this huge IT industry this huge information technology, I, I can't even tell you how many people work in the industry now uh, compared to, on a percentage-wise, what, uh, what was uh, you know, back in 1980, 1990. Um, but you know, there's, and now you, you think of the smartphone industry that just is around you know, really you know, five, 10 years. Uh, all the industry that's cropped up around smartphones. So we can't, I don't think we can even imagine what, what the job, what, type of jobs will happen, but you know, uh, you know, you can think, well, there's gotta be people that really understand drones uh, and how to use drones. There's gonna be consultants that just focus on drones or, or just on the, ro the service robots or just on robots in hotels. You know? So there's, there's gonna be jobs that we can't even think about. And, and like I said, uh, you know, don't be afraid of that, uh, embrace it. So, uh, going up. Um, I'm just wondering if you're aware of any current initiatives or research that look into the changes that would need to happen in your primary and secondary education to adapt to this. So do you think kids are going to be learning about the anatomy of a drone instead of learning how to write in cursive? Uh, I didn't talk about how you know, cognitive computing will impact the education industry, but I'm excited about it. Um, uh, there... There is work going on right now to try to figure out, uh, you know, how how to make learning more personalized. We all learn differently. Some of us, you know, learn very well in a classroom environment. Others, you learn better maybe doing a little one-on-one -on -one stuff, and then everything in, in between. We all learn differently, and so I think I think learning. The education process uh, for primary, secondary, or higher ed uh, is going to be transformed by these cognitive coaches. Uh, I envision, you know, a, a teacher in a, in a primary, you know, or you know, K one through twelve, having a, a physical robot in the room uh, that is kind of a teacher's assistant. Uh, maybe it, you know, is similar to Pepper. It understands emotions. It understands uh, all the kids in that room and knows them you know, by name, uh, knows what their learning capabilities are, and uh, knows where they are in the learning cycle. Uh, and the kids can come up to that teacher's robot assistant and, and ask that teacher's robot assistant questions uh, and get, you know, get answers. And, and, uh, and then the kids also have their quote unquote cognitive coach uh, on their phone or whatever. Uh, and that coach, no, again, knows that kid 
in detail and understands the experiences that kid has had, uh, understands well, how that kid's learned, whether the kid learns better by images, uh, through processing of images or through written, uh, and uh, can help develop the, the child in areas where uh, you know, they're, uh, they're, they need development in. And uh, I, I think it's an exciting area. I, again, it, it comes down to, you remember my image of the farm with personalized farming? Again, there's gonna be personalized uh, education. And, uh, uh, and that same type of you know, personalization is gonna happen throughout all industries. You know, personalized medicine, um, and and in other anyway, uh, it's it's an exciting future for primary and secondary education as well as as well as higher ed and and frankly education within corporations, uh, the training education professionals within corporations that are training uh, the employees are are looking at this technology as well. Thanks, Bill. So I want to follow up on that question. A lot of the jobs and the, and the categories of jobs that you imply are at risk are the types of things that higher education trains people to do. And you look at the places where Watson is headed, Wall Street, law firms, uh, accounting departments, uh, market research departments, that sort of thing. Looking out 10 years, what type of advice would you have for the leadership of a place like Notre Dame to avoid obsolescence, stay relevant, and prepare you know, students, future leaders, in a space where the you know, traditional paths might be fading and, and new ones are not yet known? Well, I, you know, I think we need to see leadership in the area of how to use these cognitive coaches. How do we, you know, how do we, um, you know, uh, how do we embed these cognitive coaches into our learning process? Uh, how do we teach people how to use them? Uh, how, how do we uh, use them to uh, increase uh, you know, the body of, of research knowledge that we're building uh, as, you know, as a faculty? Uh, and uh, uh, I don't know, so those are the areas that I'm thinking of. Uh, we're, gonna need, we're gonna need leadership in those areas. Uh, I don't know if that answered. Let me move to the dark side of this. Um, you said not long ago, embrace the technology. Um, among the folks I follow <clears throat> on LinkedIn and uh, Facebook and a few others uh, is uh, Professor Stephen Hawking yes. at, at Cambridge. Um, Professor Hawking famously thinks that Artificial intelligence, which reaches the point of singularity, will not return, meaning that artificial intelligence machines will own the earth. And he said, we'll be fortunate if they keep us as pets. So if they keep replicating smarter and smarter versions of themselves, um, he's cautioned those folks developing this technology now to work on controls. Uh, I didn't see anything in the presentation that would address the notion of control or that would address the notion of self-replication in these uh, smart devices. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm going to speak from IBM and then I'll, I'll jump off, maybe speak for myself. But from IBM's perspective, we're not trying to create artificial intelligence. We're trying to create uh, cognitive systems, we call them cognitive systems, that help augment human capability, not replace it, okay? Now, uh, let's talk about, I'm not as smart as Stephen Hawkins, <laughs> no way, uh, but I do understand that, that concern, that dark side concern. Uh, I've seen the Terminator movies. Uh, and all the other AI movies that are out there. And 
and it should be a concern for us. And I agree with his concern that we should be putting controls in these systems. And I have very high confidence that we will put controls in these systems. Uh, I have talked to people at, in IBM Research that, is, that are working on these types of controls. And, you know, and embedding these control systems inside of you know, the, the actual uh, hardware and software. Uh, and uh, all I can say is I have confidence that it will be done. Um, so I, I think we will, I personally think, as we've seen with every type of technology that humans have come up with, there are some bad people out there that will try to take advantage of the technology. And uh, just like there's bad people doing everything else, uh, and we've got to have you know the proper uh, security, judicial system in place to uh, monitor and enforce our own rules, whether they're uh, humans or uh, robots that are doing bad things. So uh, yeah, that is. Uh, I don't. I want you to think about us arriving at that quote unquote singularity well past your lifetime. Uh, but it is something for our generation to really think about and, uh, and, and uh, put those rules and controls in place. So. Bill Chamberlain, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Okay, all right, all right. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Attention this 